Let's talk about vaccinations. So the goal of a successful vaccine is to mimic an infection and provoke an adaptive immune response. And if you recall, the adaptive arms of the immune system involve B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. Those are the adaptive immune uh, responses. Uh, so in a successful vaccination, individuals are injected with molecules that mimic the infection, the infection of a natural pathogen so that B cells and T cells will recognize this molecule as the pathogen and these cells will activate and form effector cells, plasma cells, effector T cells, but also form memory cells, memory B cells and memory T cells. So in a successful vaccine, you generate these memory cells so that when the uh, pathogen ever infects you, if it does, you have protection against the pathogen. So you're going to have what's known as a secondary immune response. Um, years later, when exposed to the pathogen, these memory cells will bind the pathogen, will bind molecules from the pathogen, and will activate much quicker. If we recall from learning about memory cells, they have characteristics that allow them to um, attack a pathogen before the onset of symptoms. So memory cells are more numerous in terms of um, cells that recognize the pathogen. Uh, there are lots of naive cells, but very few of them might recognize the pathogen, whereas the memory cells already uh, have proliferated and already recognize the pathogen. Memory cells are also easier to activate. They take smaller quan quantities of pathogen to activate. They're quicker to activate. Naive cells, uh, B cells and T cells, take one to two weeks uh, to divide and differentiate. Memory B cells, within days, very quickly, will uh, unleash their attack. And at least for memory B cells, they have already undergone isotype switching and affinity maturation and make high affinity antibody. So a successful vaccine will have made memory cells so that if you are ever exposed to the real pathogen, you will eliminate the pathogen before disease symptoms appear. Um, there's a great historical case study on vaccines. The first successful vaccine um, was uh, generated against this virus called variola virus. So variola virus, um, which is a member of the poxivirus family, uh, caused the disease smallpox. So when you were infected by uh, the variola virus, it would typically give this skin uh, rash. The, the skin lesions, these poxes or pustules, would appear all over the body, the face, the hands, the arms, the torso. Um, and it was a very uh, virulent infection. So it had a death rate of about 25% and ranged anywhere from 10 to 30% death rate. Uh, so, pretty um, virulent virus, uh, estimated to have killed about 300 million people in the last century alone. Smallpox is actually thought to be, have been one of the biggest killers of humans in all time. More than wars, more than famine, uh, it's possible that smallpox is the biggest killer of humans. It's been around for thousands of years, and it's a pretty lethal and pretty infectious uh, virus. So, it spreads between people very easily. So if you were infected by small by the variola virus, you contracted smallpox and either you died or you lived uh, with these scars along your body because these pustules would heal and they would scar over and you would have these scars for the rest of your life. But the other thing that was observed is that survivors were always immune to reinfection. So somehow the infection um, gave individuals a lifetime immunity against smallpox. And this was um, exploited and helped us understand how pathogens establish uh, or can establish a lifelong immunity uh, in the body. So uh, once it was understood that infection could uh, give rise to protection, uh, this was um, manipulated to help protect people. So there was this process by which individuals who had a um, mild form of smallpox, if let's say they were exposed to the virus and they had a mild uh, rash, um, 
these individuals were thought, well, maybe they carried a, a version of smallpox that would still give lifelong protection, but wouldn't kill. So they would take these dried pustules from individuals who had mild disease, and they would inject it into a person who wanted to gain protection. So this person here had never been infected with smallpox, and now we are purposefully infecting them with variola virus. So this is known as variolation, and it was practiced for hundreds of years. The um, clinicians, whatever clinicians at the time, we're talking between 1000 AD and the uh, mid to late 1700s, um, would take dried pustules from individuals, grind them up, and uh, either inject them into somebody's skin using scarification, blow them up their nose, um, infect them with this weakened strain of um, variola virus. And it's actually quite effective. 99% of the time, it would give individuals a very mild infection and it would give them lifelong protection. This was known as variolation, um, named for the virus, the variola virus. So injecting people with variola virus, a weak version, um, giving them mild infection, but giving them lifelong protection. Sounds pretty great, huh? Except for the 1% of the time when it actually caused death. Because remember, you are injecting variola virus, which could cause death um, in individuals, and in fact it did. So this is not the greatest method of protecting individuals against smallpox. Still pretty good, still better than net nature, um, but turns out that there's an even better way that um, one man figured out. Uh, his name was Edward Jenner. He was an English country doctor, and he made an observation. So that is a milkmaid and that's a cow, all right? And milkmaids back then uh, milked cows. And what uh, Dr. Jenner noticed is that milkmaids never had all these smallpox scars all over their bodies. Um, he thought that was very odd. And when he investigated it a little more, he found out that milkmaids tended to never get infected by the variola virus. They never had smallpox. He wondered why that was. So it turns out that milkmaids were being exposed to a virus called cowpox. So cows can be infected with cowpox. It, would affect, it infects their udders, so they have pustules on their udders. And milkmaids, in handling their udders, would get cowpox on their skin, and they would become infected with cowpox. So humans, these milkmaids, were infected with cowpox, and it would form a few poxes on their hands, but really not cause severe disease. But what he did notice is that it made these women, these milkmaids, immune to variola virus. So infecting humans with cowpox could give somebody protection from smallpox. That was his idea. So what did he do? He took cowpox, isolated it from cows, and infected people with it. Right? So infecting humans with a cow virus. And then what did he do? is he exposed these people to smallpox, which sounds really unethical, but luckily for him, it worked. These individuals were protected from variola infection. So he had established this notion that you can inject something into individuals, something that's not even the same virus, a different virus, and give someone protection. So this, was, and this came to be known as vaccination. Um, the reason that we call this vaccination is because it started with a cow virus, and in Latin, cow is vacus. So vaccination refers to cows, uh, but of course now we don't use cows anymore for making vaccines or even this vaccine. Uh, and um, years later, uh, we uh, he, um, clinicians would use a different virus to infect humans. It turns out it's not a cow virus, even though they gave it a name that's very similar, right? called vaccinia virus. So vaccinia virus is the virus that humans have been injected with to give them protection against variola virus. Turns out vaccinia virus uh, most likely originated from horses. It's most likely a horse pox virus. Uh, and that's actually something only recently discovered where the origins of vaccinia virus. But uh, since the 1900s, Vaccine, vaccinia virus is the virus used to infect people to give them protection against variola virus. So let's see how this would work. So at the top is variola virus. If a human's infected with that, it would give them smallpox 
might kill them. The bottom is cowpox or vaccinia virus. It could be either one. And what you'll notice is that these viruses are, look very similar. Their surface antigens are almost identical. In some cases, they are identical. So when individuals are injected with cowpox or injected with vaccinia virus, that will provoke an immune response. The virus will get in them. It will replicate but not cause significant disease. And it will provoke a B cell and a T cell response. And with the B cells, for example, um, B cells use their B cell receptors to um, recognize antigens on the surface of these two viruses. And the B cells will activate. I'm not showing here, but T cells will also recognize peptides from the uh, virus. And the T cells and the B cells will activate and you'll end up getting effector cells, including plasma cells, which will secrete antibodies and memory cells. So these antibodies bind uh, epitopes on antigens that are on cowpox and vaccinia virus. And it turns out that these um, epitopes are on antigens that are also present on variola virus. So by in infecting somebody with cowpox or infecting somebody with vaccinia virus, you give them lifelong protection against cowpox and vaccinia and variola virus. And so this um, is great because you uh, will prevent future infections by variola. The, a number of other uh, aspects of variola infection make this strategy extremely successful. You can't imagine how successful it would be. Um, so why is uh, the uh, smallpox vaccine um, the sort of the gold standard for uh, vaccinations? Well, first of all, um, variola virus is a DNA virus. So it is very slow to mutate. So it is very unlikely that if you mutate, if you inject somebody with cowpox or vaccinia, that the antigens wouldn't match up with variola virus. Variola virus isn't mutating its DNA and changing its uh, epitopes on its antigens on the surface because it's a DNA virus. DNA viruses do not mutate at a very high rate. RNA viruses, on the other hand, they do mutate with a higher rate. But variola is a DNA virus, so very unlikely to mutate and change its surface antigens. Also, there's very few strains of variola virus, and all the strains of variola virus uh, line up with the strains of cowpoxes and vaccinia that were used for immunizations. Um, the other thing that makes this such a great uh, vaccine is that it's a live vaccine. When you inject somebody with cowpox or with vaccinia, the virus gets in their cells and it replicates. Very, it replicates at a low level, uh, doesn't really cause disease, but a live virus, a live infection provo provokes a much stronger immune response than injecting pieces of a pathogen. And we'll talk about the different types of vaccine in future videos. The other thing that makes this virus, so, this uh, vaccine campaign so successful is that there are no other animal reservoirs for variola virus. Um, variola virus only infects humans. So if we vaccinate virtually all humans and variola virus is not present anymore in the human population, it would be gone from uh, the world, which is exactly what it is. So variola virus, um, the nat last natural case of variola virus was in 1977. There was a huge public health campaign that spanned from the 1960s, the 1950s to the 1970s, in which um, the WHO spearheaded a campaign to vaccinate everyone on earth. Um, and if they couldn't get to everyone, at least they would get to the people who are um, in regions where smallpox outbreaks were occurring. So uh, in 1977 was the last natural case. And in the late 70s, early 80s, it was declared that very, smallpox had been eradicated. It's a great public health success. Actually, it's an amazing story to read about the um, epidemiologists and the researchers and the medical uh, um, the, the health medical uh, clinicians who were involved in this uh, public health campaign. I would highly recommend reading about it um, if you want a really good story about uh, public health and immunology. So uh, smallpox has been eradicated from the human um, population and from the earth. And again, like we said, there are no animal reservoirs. If smallpox could infect, if variola could infect humans and bears and we infect we immunized all the humans, 
if bears still carried the, the, the virus, well, then we would have to vaccinate all the bears or kill all the bears. So there's no other, but there isn't. There isn't an animal reservoir. We don't have to worry about the bears. We don't have to worry about bats or pigs or chickens carrying variola virus. Nothing else carries variola virus other than humans. And right now, no humans have infected, been infected by variola since the late 1970s. So um, actually, smallpox vaccines have stopped. Um, why bother vaccinating people if nobody's ever going to be, get exposed to variola, variola virus again? And uh, the smallpox vaccine is not readily available right now. It is available to uh, people in the military because it's possible smallpox could be used as a bioweapon. Smallpox is not has not officially disappeared from the earth because it's actually the virus is present in freezers in uh, held by the uh, the virus is held by the U.S. government and the Russian government. So they still have smallpox uh, hidden in their freezers under a lot of protection. Um, but it is possible that virus might make a comeback if someone decides to get it out of the freezer and start growing it again. It might also be possible that smallpox returns uh, due to uh, global warming and climate change. There's a lot of uh, defrosting of the permafrost in parts of Russia, in parts of Siberia. And it's possible that some virus has uh, been frozen down there and maybe some human remains. And as the uh, ground thaws and these remains become accessible to humans again, the virus might make a comeback. But for now, smallpox has been eradicated, and it is due to um, the wonderful vaccine that has been uh, first originated in cows, cowpox and Edward Jenner, and now is just grown in the lab, this virus called vaccinia virus. So this is a little introduction to um, vaccines, and in the future videos, we're going to learn about the different types of vaccines against many different types of pathogens.